And now we're very happy to welcome the Reverend Andy Alice. Thank you, Joseph. Hi, everybody. It's so good to be with you again. It's been a while. And I wish, of course, we were you know, together at the center and I had one of Nick's beautiful flower arrangements behind me instead of a, a floating bicycle. But um, <laughs> since we can create sacred space anywhere, thank you to all who are making the sacred space and gathering possible. I appreciate being able to share with you some thoughts about this month's topic of forgiveness. <clears throat> and it's always an important topic in practice. All the major spiritual philosophies and religions emphasize it. But to me, it feels especially timely given how much we need each other right now. Now, if anything, this social distancing moment proves just how interconnected and interdependent we are and how we can't afford to be any more distant from one another than we already are physically or emotionally or spiritually. And our distancing and the hardship and frustration it has brought for so many seems to have only exacerbated an already existing atmosphere of distrust, of division and vengefulness in our communities. And we see it in cancel culture, in mudslinging on social media, in smackdowns on the news networks, in reruns of any real housewives show. And there's a general sense felt by many of, of society coming apart at the seams. And people ask, well, how do we stop it? How do we stop it all from snowballing into civil war? Well, as Desmond Tutu and his daughter Mfo Tutu write in the book of Forgiving, forgiveness, quote, is the way we mend tears in the social fabric. Forgiveness is the way we stop our human community from unraveling, unquote. And forgiveness is also how we keep our human community growing. Ernest Holmes in the Science of Mind article, Our Need for Forgiveness, says, quote, life intends and wants to give us every good thing, but when the circuit is stopped at any point, it is slowed at every point. Nothing is more important than that we learn how to forgive both ourselves and others, unquote. So forgiveness is what can heal the other social distancing, our emotional and spiritual wounds, and reopen our stopped circuits to allow spirit and love to flow in our lives and relationships with the abundance it attends. We all get hurt and we all hurt one another and we will continue to do so as long as we live. And each time we get hurt, we'll have the choice to seek revenge or to forgive. Revenge, the proverbial eye for an eye, may seem satisfying in the heat of the moment, but it really just wounds everyone involved and continues the cycle of hurt and pain. But forgiveness breaks that cycle. And if we're going to truly affirm the manifestation of the kingdom of heaven here and now, and the expression of the highest spiritual principle in loving one another unconditionally. And if we're going to sing, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me, then forgiveness is our best choice. And not that it's easy. In many cases, especially of the worst human cruelty, it can seem impossible. But with God, with loving intention, all things are possible. One extraordinary example of this is in a prayer found on a piece of paper near the body of a dead child in World War II's Ravensbrück concentration camp. And it reads, Lord, remember not only the men and women of good will, but also those of evil will but remember not all the suffering they have inflicted upon us, 
Remember the fruits we have borne thanks to the suffering, our comradeship, our loyalty, our humility, our courage, our generosity, the greatness of heart which has grown out of all this. And when they come to the judgment, let all the fruit that we have borne be their forgiveness. Every time I read that, I'm, I'm just floored. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote in his sermon, Love in Action, forgiveness is not an occasional act, it is a permanent attitude. Forgiveness is not an occasional act, it is a permanent attitude. And I can't imagine the forgiveness in that prayer was an occasional act for its author. To be able to offer such grace, they must have come to that prayer already with a cultivated and consistently practiced open-heartedness, showing that forgiveness is not just reactive. Forgiveness as a permanent attitude is also proactive. So how do we work to live in a permanent and proactive attitude of forgiveness? How do we approach ourselves, each other, and life in a living state of compassion and grace so that we're always primed to choose forgiveness over revenge. One thing to do is to remember that as the tutus also say in the Book of Forgiving, quote, our nature is goodness. Yes, we do much that is bad, but our essential nature is good. If it were not, then we would not be shocked and dismayed when we harm one another. When someone does something ghastly, it makes the news because it is the exception to the rule. We live surrounded by so much love, kindness, and trust that we forget it is remarkable." Unquote. So everyone's nature is goodness. Everyone's nature is goodness. Those who hurt us, those we hurt, and we ourselves, goodness. So what happens to it? <laughs> well, hold on to that question. Reverend Diane Burke, founder and spiritual director of One Spirit Interfaith Seminary, says that forgiveness, quote, is the decision to open ourselves to seeing the other with a deeper vision, a deeper insight, a vision that sees beyond the personality, the behavior, the act of insensitivity, harshness, even cruelty to the spiritual being, the child of God who has forgotten who they are and has acted out of that forgetfulness." Unquote. We are all fellow children of God whose nature is goodness and we hurt one another when we forget that, when we stop relating to each other and ourselves as love embodied. Dr. King also writes in Love in Action about Jesus, one of the finest models of forgiveness that we have, who while being crucified could have cursed his killers and cried out to God, Father, get even with them, or Father, let loose the mighty thunderbolts of righteous wrath and destroy them. But instead, in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus, even in the midst of excruciating death, still was able to see those killing him as children of God who had forgotten who they were and were acting out of that forgetfulness. When we forget who we truly are, expressions of one loving spirit, we can let the illusions of ego start to define us. And then we can start seeing through an othering lens of right and wrong, good and bad, winners and losers, allies and enemies, and all the ways that appear to separate us instead of unite us, which then can make us insecure and afraid. The spiritual program, A Course in Miracles, says Reverend Burke, quote, teaches that anything anyone does that is not loving is always an expression of fear, of fear. A, cr 
cry for love, a call for acknowledgement, respect, help, and love, no matter what form it takes. Forgiveness, then, is a choice we make to hear the call for love, to recognize the cry for help behind the appearance of the unloving." Unquote. So can you think of a time in your life when you've been hurt? And are you able to see, looking through your soul's eyes, those who hurt you as fellow children of God, as love embodied, who forgot that about themselves, or maybe was never even loved well enough to know that, and hurt you out of an expression of their own fear? Could reframing a past hurt like that start to release you from the grip of your own fear, however it manifests, anger, resentment, distrust, division, vengefulness, possibly even to a point where you could forgive so the past doesn't have so much power anymore? And there's an important distinction here. I'm talking about forgiving the person. This doesn't mean ignoring what happened. We don't simply allow wrongdoing. Because harmful action and its results absolutely need to be addressed, especially because harmful action hurts both the victim and the perpetrator. It's the person for whom you can choose to release your anger or hatred. The separating negative action from the actor can help to cultivate a permanent attitude of forgiveness. And notice how the author of the prayer I read prayed for men and women of good will and evil will, not for good or evil men and women. Something I try to do to stay in that headspace is to catch myself when I'm labeling someone in the negative, like, oh, he is such an idiot. I take a breath and I rephrase it as, that was such an idiotic thing he did. And that helps me to not keep that person at such a distance as an other, but to keep them closer as a fellow brother or sister in spirit who, who, like me, like all of us, can do both idiotic things and thoughtful things. It helps me to relate to that person as how I'd like to be related to, as a, as a whole human being capable of growth and change and not defined and imprisoned by a particular action or trait. So in addition to opening ourselves to seeing the fellow spirits of those who hurt us, is it possible, and it may not be yet or ever, but is it possible for you to see from a hurtful act, past hurtful action or event itself, as the author of the prayer describes, any fruits you may have borne thanks to your suffering? And not instead of the suffering, we don't wanna minimize it or deny it, and not in the suffering as if it was meant to happen for some cruel lesson, but to also see any fruits, perhaps any growth that may have come of it. And if so, might that help you be open to growth coming out of any future hurt? So then if it happens, you may be able to forgive those who hurt you more easily. I know these are not simple questions and not simple answers. Consider this abridged affirmation by Ernest Holmes from the book, How to Change Your Life. In the peace of God, I feel the love of a holy presence. In this consciousness of love, all sense of fear slips away. I see good in everything, God personified in all people and life manifest in every event. So in closing, I said at the beginning how timely I feel our topic of forgiveness is. And in fact, this coming week may well give us ample opportunity to exercise our permanent attitudes of forgiveness, to see good in everything God, in all people, and life manifest in every event. And of course, I'm talking about the election. And however it turns out, 
there are going to be people who are delighted and people who are distressed. And those delighted may feel a sense of righteous vindication and may feel tempted to express that. Those distressed may feel shocked, suspicious, afraid, and may even act out of their fear. So I invite all of us, and I know this may be a really hard thing to do, especially for myself, to approach the election with an attitude of forgiveness. So that no matter how we feel about the results, we will work to see those who voted the same as us and differently from us, and those who we voted for and not, as fellow children of God. To relate to everyone with compassion and curiosity and creativity, and to trust that good and growth can come out of it, even if that seems impossible. Living from a permanent attitude of forgiveness is how we can start this coming week and always to break any potential cycles of revenge, to heal our hurts, our divisions, and to allow our essential goodness and love to flow freely and abundantly so that we and our community and our world can grow into the fullness of life that spirit intends for us all. Thanks for listening and may it be so.